products these days are complicated. Your cell phone is a supercomputer connected to a vast web of services. Amazon is a service that's built on top of many other businesses. And a modern online game like World of Warcraft contains combat systems, progression ladders, a virtual world, and an in-game economy all working together. So as a product creator, how do you approach building something that has so many different moving parts? In this video, you'll learn timeless system design principles that can help you bring any complex product or service to life. Here's Raf Koster, lead designer on Ultima Online and Star Wars Galaxies, sharing his practical wisdom about how to bring a system to life from the ground up. The first step is a bit of analysis. So you've got a goal, you've got a product goal in mind. It almost certainly means that there's objects in there that people are dealing with. It might be, I want to create this thing. It might be, I want to arrange these things. Wh wh whatever that is. Make yourself a, a list of what are the things. Like, what are the objects? What are the components that are going into this mix? In the game World of Warcraft, for example, Objects include armor and weapons, which boost your item level, and consumables, which boost your health and other stats. Ask yourself, what are the numbers that move around? Identify those. Depending on what domain of systems design you're working in, these may have different terms. In economic systems, we call them currencies. Currencies are a number that moves up and down. In other systems, we, act, we might call them our resources. And sometimes they only go up. Sometimes they go up and you spend them and they come back down. The numbers in World of Warcraft include your reputation, job skill level, item level, and stats like strength, stamina, dexterity, and intelligence. Now, these stats can go up and down, but your experience points will only go up. These are the bones and sinew of a system, okay? <laughs> These are the things that really make a system work. And one last thing, what are the things a user can do? The verbs, the inputs, the buttons. And you make a little list of those. The verbs in World of Warcraft include fetching items, killing monsters, farming gold, and practicing a skill like fishing or leatherworking. Each of these actions or verbs will change your numbers, the things that you can see that tell you how you're doing. Right off the bat, if in your process these lists are long, take a step back. I'll use a rule of thumb here. Think in threes. If you have more than three objects, more than three numbers, and more than three verbs, you might be thinking at the wrong level of granularity. It doesn't mean that there might not be more numbers or objects or whatever in the system but it means you're trying to boil the ocean. The highest level of a car actually only has, I go from point A to point B, how far along am I? How fast am I going? Which direction am I pointing? I'm done, three things, right? Like it's small. You go deep into a car and sure, now I've got fuel, oil, and I have all these things interacting. Car speed will in fact decompose into lots of systems with lots more numbers. But at one level of design, it's just one of, one of three. And then think about how you can model it. It doesn't mean implementing. It could just mean thinking about what happens, walking through the flows. Okay, so if I add more water to the tub, the level will go up to here. Oh, okay. You can build it in Excel. If you have engineers, you can get them to build a simple toy version of it. And what you're looking for is where are the places where the system's internal feedback causes numbers to go off in various directions. And you ask yourself things like, what happens if this number keeps going up forever? What happens if this number goes to nothing? Like those are your first cut questions. What happens if I run out of this kind of thing? What if the system causes this number to go beyond what I expect? In a bathtub, it turns out, you know all bathtubs have two drains on them. Most people don't think about it, but all bathtubs have two drains. There's a second drain located between the bottom and the faucet, so that when a tub gets to a certain point, it starts draining out of the side, right? That's an overflow mechanism. As you set up a system, put boundaries on all of those numbers and gauges. 
even if it's just a warning to you, the developer. And that way, even if your system runs amok, you can kind of limit the damage. Finding those bounds can be a question of experimentation. Piece of advice when experimenting. As you say, oh, pushing this button or doing this results in a change. Work on one number at a time because one number, the effect of it will spread. The bounds in World of Warcraft limit how fast monsters respawn. Too fast and players all will die, but too slow and players will get bored. The bounds also limit the amount of gold you earn for killing a monster. Too much and inflation will spiral out of control. Too little and the game will become a boring grind. The work on one number... Make sure you've got bounds to keep it from going bananas. And if you're not sure what that number is doing, double it or have it. In fact, one of the most efficient ways to arrive at finding something out of a big spread is to keep cutting things in half and go, it's not in this half, it's in this half, it's in this half, right? So cutting and doubling is a very valuable tool for tuning these things. Graphs are extraordinarily useful when you are working on these systems, the things that you're going to be worried about in systems are often around the rate of change, not the fact that something changed. So it's very useful for you as a designer, as a developer, to be able to see rates of change. So give yourself dashboards that graph things over time so you can see how things moved and changed. Because just watching a single number is often not going to help you too. You know, this is where some of those weirder Excel sheets come in handy, right? Like the uh, bubble plot, for example, is actually a very valuable one for looking at systems because most graphs show you two pieces of info at a time. A system, you know, will often involve three. So get comfy with bubble plots. You often end up needing them. For example, World of Warcraft has a developer dashboard that shows statistics like average session time, monthly active users, and number of raids and dungeons played per month. And the last thing, again, just to circle back, make sure you're doing this all with an eye towards the user's intent. Any number you show, you're telling the user this is important. If it's a number that only ever goes up, that is a subliminal incentive to just make it go up. And that might not be the behavior you want. Think about what you choose to expose because mantra inside the startup is you are what you measure. It turns out that's true for a user of anything. They become the numbers that you present to them. They shape their behavior around the feedback you give them. So think carefully about what you present back out and make sure it's in service of the user's actual goal. Feedback is actually a term that has overlapping, subtly different meanings that people who are comfortable in talking systems lingo pick up which of the the meanings it is from context and people who aren't don't and therefore get very confused very quickly. When you interact with something, you know, I interact with the car, I hit the gas, I press the pedal. Stuff changes inside the black box. Cylinders move, car rumbles, all kinds of things go on in there. Chemical reactions, energy generated, blah, blah, blah. Most of that we don't know about. There are state changes that happen in the system and we need to learn what changed, right? And so the system gives us information. It gives us a lump of information. We get to see the the RPM rev, right? We certainly hear the rumble, right? If you gun your car, you go, right? Depending on what state the car is in, maybe the car leaps forward. That's pretty clear feedback when you hit the gas. We call that stuff feedback from the system. Just like when I ask someone for advice, I get feedback, right? What that meaning of the word means is oh, the loop is closing, I did something, stuff happened magically inside the box, and then I get this lump of information back. That's one kind of feedback, and it's um, a very common casual usage, and if, if one were trying to be more precise, one could break that down, actually, into, uh, it's a dashboard of the state, it's specific reports on what changed, like what deltas there were, and so on. And then there is the more technical sense of feedback. And in this, we might think about what's going on inside the car, okay? I hit the gas, the car is moving, 
and it is rolling downhill because I hit the gas. It had been steady, and now it's going. But we're on a slope. If I hit the gas, I know the car is going to speed up. And it turns out that these two things affect each other. If I hit the gas while I'm on a downslope, guess what? I'm going to get an even larger effect than I thought. Because systems are nested, the kind of feedback where, hey, here's a dump of info, the kind we were just talking about, when something comes back at you, um, you take it in and you adjust what you're doing, right? Oh, my car started moving. Great. I take it in. Now I build on that and I start turning the wheel or I let off the gas or whatever. I make new decisions. Because systems are built out of smaller systems much of the time, what happens inside when one system gives feedback to another system is that they start doing things on their own that we don't even know about or that we aren't necessarily directly controlling. The technical term for those is that there are positive and negative feedback loops inside the system, right? Oh, I hit the gas and I'm on a slope. These compound in a way that isn't necessarily directly visible. As you approach the temperature in an oven, less heat gets put in because you're coming in to the temperature you want or um, compound interest in a bank. Those are examples of feedback loops within the oven, within the financial system. It's deeply connected to the other kind of feedback, but that's one of the places that people get confused fastest because positive feedback when you say I'm asking for advice means you heard something good. And positive feedback when you're talking about system dynamics means a system that is incrementing values in an ongoing way where two systems that are moving are causing the system as a whole to gain, you know, the, the stocks are increasing. Basically, the, the numbers tend to be going up. We have to be cautious with those terms. It's one of these things where they're technically coming from the same place, but particularly to a layperson, they mean very different things. And as we talk about these, we end up using them interchangeably because we know what we mean. My favorite example of a system with unintended consequences was back when we did Ultima Online. For a while, we had a real problem with players attacking other players in the game. And so we tried to create systems that would reduce the incidence of that. We created a system where when a player was killed by another player in the game, they could report them and put a bounty on their head. The thought was this will generate more gameplay. It will result in good guys chasing after bad guys. And instead, the bounties became a high score table for bad guys and they competed to climb to the top of the ladder. This isn't that different from the same system dynamic that today we see on, let's say, Twitter or gaming YouTube's algorithms where people have set up systems that are supposed to be reinforcing good behavior, such as likes or replies, or in the case of YouTube, the algorithm driving you towards what's supposed to be interesting content and instead, it's driving people to create outrageous content in order to draw eyeballs. And often the, that content is not what the platform wants. And so it's the same idea that you can try changing a system or adding a system by putting in rewards into it. And if you don't understand the underlying system behind the rewards, what it is that motivates people, you might get out the exact opposite of what you wanted. But of course, once you understand what's going on, the principle is very simple. You are rewarding attention. What gets attention? Outrageousness. No matter how well you design your system, there'll always be surprises. People can and will try and game any system you give them. That's human nature. So you're gonna have to spend time tuning your reward system after its release, once you see how people actually behave. It's hard work, but as every system designer knows, it's an essential part of the job. To learn more about system design, check out these videos. See you soon. Mm -hmm.